All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the April 2021 virtual field trip to Lucia S. Nash Preserve. My name is Michelle Brocious uh, with Western Chicago Audubon Society. I'm a board member and field trip co-coordinator. And let me just tell you a little bit uh, about what this program involves in case you haven't tuned in in the past. So every month I invite uh, members and guests of Western Chicago Audubon Society to visit a location that I select. Uh, April was Lucia S. Nash Preserve. Mm -hmm. Throughout the month, uh, people who register for the program go to the location independently to enjoy the location. And while there, a uh, participant yeah. take photographs. And honestly, uh, I'm not even sure that we need to... Uh, can I have everyone please mute? Anymore. With everything now that we are gathering now, Okay, so uh, while at the location, uh, participants do a number of things. Uh, keep bird lists or species lists of what they've seen, take photographs, and then submit journaling to me, which I compile and include here in the presentation that I present tonight. And so this is the April 2021 field trip. Uh, I give everyone till the end of the month and a little bit of time to get their submissions to me and then I take a little time to put the presentation together. So hence we're into the second week of May to present April's field trip. All right, so a little bit about Lucia S. Nash Preserve. So Lucia S. Nash Preserve is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy and is open to the public April through November. The 650-acre Lucia S. Nash Preserve located in Geauga County includes Snow Lake, a small kettle lake surrounded by emergent marsh, sedge meadow, and shrub swamp. Low hills around the lake support upland forests with scattered vernal pools and swamp forests. The preserve also protects the only remaining old-growth white pine boreal fen in Ohio. Lucia S. Nash Preserve, formerly known as White Pine Bog, is part of a larger 20,000-acre wetland complex of boggy bottomland known as the Cuyahoga Wetlands, an area considered one of the finest remaining glacial wetlands in Ohio. The complex also includes the Geauga Park District's Burton Wetlands Nature Preserve and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History's Fern Lake. The property is adjacent to a patchwork of 18,000 acres the city of Akron owns and manages to protect the city's drinking water reservoirs downstream. The 300,000 customers who rely on Akron's municipal water system benefit from the protection of the Lucia S. Nash Preserve and other nearby natural areas. And those three paragraphs were taken directly from the Nature Conservancy's website, Lucia S. Nash Preserve page. And then I also want to encourage you to watch a Lucia S. Nash Preserve virtual naturalist hike with Terry Seidel. Uh, he is a three to four minute video. He takes you down the Barbara A. Lipscomb Trail and maybe into some other areas and points out some interesting things about the preserve. So uh, after, after tonight, we will publish this presentation. You can go right in and click the link if you feel so inclined. All right, so a little bit about the target species. Uh, the first species is the sandhill crane. So whether stepping singly across a wet meadow or filling the sky by the hundreds and thousands, sandhill cranes have an elegance that draws attention. These tall gray-bodied crimson cat birds breed in open wetlands, fields, and prairies across North America. They group together in great numbers, filling the air with distinctive rolling cries. Mates display to each other with exuberant dances that retain a gangly grace. Sandhill crane populations are generally strong, but isolated populations in Mississippi and Cuba are endangered. That's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Sandhill Crane Overview page. And as you can see, Northeast Ohio is at the bottom of their breeding range, with the exception of the year-round pockets to the south. So I wanted to include uh, the range map because it is such an unusual and interesting range map. They're just like kind of you know all over the place, and then here. These purple areas here, here, and here, they can be found year round, as was mentioned um, in the description. And then here we are in Northeast Ohio, just the very bottom of that orange breeding ground. And then a beautiful photo of a Samuel Crane. And this was taken at Sandy Ridge Reservation by Tom Fishburn. We have pictures of Samuel Cranes that were taken at the preserve, but this is a nice close up so you can really see what this bird looks like. Uh, the, the birds, uh, the Samuel Crane seen at the preserve tended to be a little further away. All right, the second target species is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. 
On a walk through the forest, you might spot rows of shallow holes and tree bark. In the east, this is the work of the yellow-bellied sapsucker, an enterprising woodpecker that laughs up the leaking sap and any trapped insects with its specialized brush-tipped tongue. Attired sharply in bar um, barred black and white with a red cap and in male's throat, they sit still on a tree on tree trunks for long intervals while feeding. To find one, listen for their loud mewing calls or stutter drumming. And that again is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Yellow Bellied Sapsucker Overview. Uh, the Yellow Bellied Sapsucker's pre breeding migratory season is mid March through mid May and passes through Northeast Ohio for spring migration as it continues north to the breeding ground. So again, I included the range map. You can see um, the Northeast Ohio is in yellow, that is their migration. So uh, looking for them in April was the perfect time of year to try and find them. And then photo to the right here, yellow-bellied sapsucker at Lucia F. Nash Preserve taken by Sean Missig. And as you can see, this one is a male as it has the red throat. All right, so now we're going to dive into participant submissions. Al Rand visited the preserve twice and saw a total of 27 species on his two trips. So he says, what a wonderful location. I'm so glad to have been introduced to it as part of the virtual field trip series. The history is interesting as is the path taken to turn it into the public park it is today. The diverse habitats are bound to hold many secrets just waiting to be uncovered. I visited on April 3rd and April 18th was able to hit all the trails on the 3rd, but got rained out on the 18th in less than an hour. However, I was lucky enough to encounter both of the target species. The cranes were, the, the cranes there are magnificent, way more natural than those at the Sandy Ridge Reservation. Sorry, Kevin. So for those of you who aren't local to Northeast Ohio, we do have uh, a very outgoing, friendly sand oak crane at Sandy Ridge Reservation called Kevin. And this crane will come right up to people. Um, so that is what Al was referring to. Right, I'm looking forward to visiting the summer when birding is slow to see how many dragonfly species I can find. People that go oding are just as passionate as birders. Oding is the slang term for looking for dragonflies because they are in the odonata order in the tree of life. Most dragonfly observations added to iNaturalist are added to the Ohio Dragonfly Survey or the Ohio Odonata Survey group. There are certain dragonfly species that create the same buzz like the Kirtland's warbler does in the birding world. What a thrill it would be if one or more were found to be at the Nash Preserve. As for the birds, I identified 27 different species. And on the um, right-hand side, beautiful photo of the Barbara A. Lipscomb Trail at Lucia S. Nash Preserve taken by Tom Fishburn. And here is Al Rand's bird list. Uh, I always uh, highlight notable species in red. Now, these are just what I find notable. You, if you were doing this, you might have highlighted different species, and that is okay. But the ones that I thought uh, really stood out, trumpeter swan, wood duck, sandhill crane, red-tailed hawk, bald eagle, yellow-bellied sapsucker, tree swallow, golden crown kinglet, brown creeper, swamp sparrow, and pine warbler. And a beautiful photo of a wood duck at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom Fishburn. All right, now here is my submission. I visited the preserve twice and had a total of 18 species between the two visits. So I visited Lucia S. Nash Preserve on April 17th and 24th. The morning of the 17th was very dull and overcast, which didn't help my photography abilities, but I otherwise enjoyed my time at the preserve. My bird highlights for the trip include a pileated woodpecker, four turkey vulture, two of which came to came into land on a nearby tree, and a pair of sandhill crane, which were a joy to see as they glided down to Snow Lake. So um, I have here the picture of the pileated woodpecker on the left. And, you know, it kind of looks like it was right there, and I just looked up into the tree, but that was actually pretty far away. I did some serious cropping <laughs> with that image, um, and I was happy that I at least got it in, in the frame there. And then a picture of the one of the turkey vultures seen at the preserve. 
As I explored the preserve, I stopped along the trails to admire a few plants. iNaturalist places one of the plants that I found near the boardwalk to Snow Lake in the genus Angelica, which contains about 60 species. I have inquired about the species in a plant identification Facebook group, but have not received any responses to help me narrow down the identification, nor have I received a confirmation or suggestion from a fellow iNaturalist user. The species remains a mystery for now, but I did pause to appreciate its bright green leaves in a teardrop cluster. So I really liked how that kind of formed that, that teardrop. I thought that was really pretty. All right, the second and perhaps my most favorite of the plants I admired that day were the fiddleheads that I found along the woodland leaf trail. Fiddleheads are the furled fronds of a young fern and remind me of something out of a fairy tale. Lastly, the marsh marigold was a lovely sight in the forest near a vernal pool. So here the fiddleheads are in the middle and then here's the marsh marigold. Just a little a clump of them in the forest. All right, spring is the time of year to find and appreciate vernal pools, and the forests at Lucia S. Nash Preserve contain quite a few areas. Vernal pools are a really interesting habitat and are special because they are temporary. Vernal pools form every spring due to rain, rising groundwater, and runoff, but then are completely dry in the summer. A vernal pool's temporary nature prohibits fish from getting established in the area, making this a great breeding ground for amphibians and invertebrates as there are no fish to prey on their eggs. Vernal pools are also a sensitive habitat, so be sure to stay on the designated trails. I am very appreciative that the Nature Conservancy planned their Woodland Loop Trail to pass by a few of these precious pools for observation. And then I have a picture of one of the vernal pools at Lucia S. Nash Preserve on the right-hand side there. All right, the large leafy plants in the photos below are skunk cabbage, which is a perennial wildflower that grows in the swampy and wet areas of forests. This plant sprouts in early spring and has the ability to create its own heat, which serves to melt any early spring snow around itself. So I, I like these pictures. Um, again, the one on the left is a vernal pool and has some skunk cabbage around it. And the picture on the right, it's just a really small, shallow pool or maybe just even a puddle. But I really like how the, the skunk cabbage just encircled it. I thought that was a really cool thing to see and I wanted to share it with all of you. All right. After Lucia S. Nash Preserve, I swung by nearby Ledoux Reservoir as I had some time before I needed to head into Mayfield for my second COVID-19 vaccine. Here I saw a common loon. Although not my spark bird, which is the bird that ignites one's enthusiasm for birding, this bird is the one that made me want to get into photography. I chased this bird and first saw it in spring of 2020 and wished I had the right tools to take an image. This bird only passes through Northeast Ohio during migration. Now, a year later, I happen upon this bird in less than ideal photography conditions and hope I did it justice. So, uh, Tom, it was actually you a, a year ago that posted on Facebook about a common loon that, and you had some pictures, and I reached out to you and said, where did you see it? And you told me to go to Coal Lake, so it was you that helped me chase that bird last spring. And so, in a sense, you really helped me become a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> because when I saw that bird, I was like, oh, I really wish, I really wish that I had my, my cell phone camera, but it was far out. Uh, and that was when I first started thinking about getting my own camera. So thank you, Tom, for your inspiration. And there I have a, uh, a picture, one of the pictures I took with a common loon at Ledoux Reservoir. And I know that Ledoux is not um, Lucia F. Nash, but occasionally... I'll get a picture or an account from someone on these field trips asking, oh, it was part of my day and it was really special and, and I always allow it. So I figured I'd give myself the allowance this time. All right, and then here's two more pictures of the loon at Ledoux Reservoir. All right, the morning of April 24th was a much sunnier morning than my last visit. I didn't happen to see either target species on this visit, but I had a fantastic experience with an Eastern Phoebe. On the Barbara Ellipscombe Trail, close to Snow Lake, there is an old fishing hunting lodge, and this Eastern Phoebe has chosen the eaves of this lodge for her nesting site. Phoebes tend to reuse nests from previous years, so she may have just been conducting some repairs as the nest looked complete to me. I'm trying to figure out exactly what she has in her beak. Looks like it could be a grub, but it's covered in mud, and I do know that Phoebes use mud along with other materials in building their nests. I'm calling this bird a she, as this one was building the nest, and only the female Phoebes do this task. There was another Phoebe that hung way back at a distance, presumably the male. Phoebes prefer solitude even during the breeding season. 
and the picture I took of the Phoebe um, holding the mud or whatever that is um, that, that she used to construct her nest. All right, I have included a photo of the nest here, but it was in the shadow of the eaves and turned out really grainy due to high ISO. I applied noise reduction, which affected the sharpness of this image. Uh, as it is spring, it is likely that birders will come across a nest or two. Therefore, please remember your nest etiquette and keep your distance. This Phoebe flew to the nest with building materials several times while I observed, and therefore I knew I was at a comfortable distance for her. And I found this amazing quote that I want to read to you. So the Phoebe bird is a wise architect and perhaps enjoys as great an immunity from danger, both in its person and its nest, as any other bird. Its modest ashen gray suit is the color of the rocks where it builds, and the moss of which it makes such for use gives to its nest the look of a natural growth or accretion. And that's a quote by John Burroughs, an American naturalist and author um, from some time ago. And uh, as you can see, that nest does look very natural with, you know, it's got a leaf sticking up there and mosses and you know if they're you know before you know humans came and really started building their structures perhaps they were building a more on rocks or, or cliff faces and this would look very natural um, so I just wanted to point that out all right then here are two more pictures so an additional picture of the Phoebe with uh, mud in her beak on the left there. And then that's the picture of the fishing hunting lodge on the right. And the nest, this is taken from the Lipscomb Trail and the nest is in this back corner. And so I actually, this gravel here goes all the way around. And I did come to the back here and I stood, stood quite a way back just to make sure I wasn't uh, prohibiting her from um, tending to her nest. But I, I took most of the pictures from behind the building. And there are nests all over this building. There's a nest here, and there's several on the back. As there, there's more, yeah, you can kind of see some growth there. Um, and I'm sure there's nests on all the sides. So it has been well used by birds. All right, two more pictures of the Eastern Phoebe at Lucia S. Nash Preserve. Thank you, Betsy. I got that message. All right, and then Eastern Phoebe, again, holding different uh, building materials. So I was able to get quite a few shots on uh, quite a few different trips for this bird. All right, after spending some time with the Phoebe, I said goodbye and headed toward the Snow Lake observation deck. I had just made it to the deck from the long walk down the poor walk when a flock of seven blue-winged teal flew right over me, heading toward the far side of the lake. Nothing else was really happening at the lake other than Canada goose activity and a great blue heron in the distance, so I decided to check out the Woodland Loop Trail. I stopped briefly at the lodge again, but the Phoebe must have been out collecting more materials, so I continued on my way. On the Woodland Loop Trail, I found a cute chipmunk that almost seemed to hover at attention on a log. Uh, and there it is right there. Very, I had to include it. It was so cute. Um, and the Woodland Loop Trail also seemed to be full of wood duck perched high up in the trees. They are one of the few duck species that have strong claws for gripping branches. I never saw them until they were startled from their perches and flew off, making their loud, woo weak call. Also, along the trail, I was followed briefly by a couple black cat chickadees, and then witnessed a red-bellied woodpecker employing an interesting neck-twisting strategy to get at a meal. I once saw a downy doing the exact same thing at another location. Woodpeckers must have flexible necks. And here's the uh, one of the black cat chickadees, one of the two that followed me just for a little section of the trail. And, and chickadees will sometimes do that. I don't know if they're, they're curious or they just want to keep an eye on you. Um, but it, they followed me for a few tree hops. And there is the red-bellied woodpecker. And as you can see on the right, it's really twisting its neck around to get into that hole. And I, I also like this picture because you can see its tongue right there. It's, it's really pushing its tongue in to get it, you know, what, whatever it's in there it wants to eat. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was uh, really interesting to see. Now, oh, here's my bird list. Um, notable species are the wood duck, the blue winged teal, sandhill crane, pileated woodpecker, eastern eastern phoebe, and the eastern towhee. And I totally forgot to mention the eastern towhee. Um, it did happen on my second visit. I was on the Barbara Ellipscomb Trail, and I was just walking, and it flew 
right in front of my face. Like I felt the wind of it and I was start. I didn't see it coming. I just, I was startled when I looked and it's a towhee and it, it landed pretty far back. And I, I, I did get a picture of it, but it turned out blurry because it only stayed there for a moment and it left. Um, but I, I almost ran right into a towhee. All right, and there's a, an additional picture of the eastern phoebe. Uh, I don't believe it has any nesting material that time. I think it had flown down from the nest just to perch for a second before flying off for more materials. All right, and that brings us to Sean. Sean Missig I saw 20 species, and he visited the preserve three times. So this is what he says. I visited on April 4th, 11th, and 18th. From my first visit to Lucia S. Nash Preserve, I was in awe. When I first arrived to the parking area, it felt like I was tucked away from civilization, even though I really hadn't driven very far from the road. Stepping out of the truck proved that to be correct. It was quiet and very serene. The only sound you heard was the animals nearby or the various birds from the lake. In the parking area, I was greeted by the sounds of red-bellied woodpeckers as they were playing high in the trees above. I also heard a yellow-bellied sapsucker, and on my second trip, it made an appearance very close to the parking area. Thankfully, it did not appear to be bothered by me, and I was able to take many shots before heading to the path. I do not get many of these by me, so they are always a pleasant sight to see when I'm out. All right, as I made my way down the trail, I arrived at the first opening where some smaller birds were bouncing around in the bush and would not sit still. After watching for quite some time and only getting a few shots, I decided to move on. I later identified these as golden crown kinglets, but do not have any good shots to show for it. On 418, this area also provided a Virginia rail that was pointed out to me by other birders who were watching it from the path. I did see it and get to hear it call, but I was unable to get pictures before it found its way into cover. On the right-hand side, uh, a nice picture of the yellow-bellied stamp sucker at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Missig. And again, this is just another angle um, from the shot that was shown earlier when I was introducing the target species. All right, continuing up the path, I saw robins, red-breasted nuthatches, and cardinals flying in and out of the area. I also saw a few downy woodpeckers looking for a meal in some trees. A hairy woodpecker was also mixed in with the downies. As I walked further, I started to hear the calls of Sandhill Crane in the distance. I was hoping to see a few of these since the only ones I've seen are at Sandy Ridge and they have no problem with people. I wanted to see more of a natural setting for these animals and the preserve did not disappoint. I made it to the end of the path and it led me onto a floating dock that went out into the lake a little ways. This spot was the highlight of each trip for me. It was very peaceful and each time I went, I spent the majority of my time just sitting on the dock capturing the wildlife and a sunburn. <laughs> I found a lot of wildlife here on the other side of the lake. At this point, I was very happy that I'd recently picked up my 150 to 600 millimeter lens. The first bird I photographed here was an osprey in the distance flying over the lake. I was hoping it would stick around and attempt to catch a meal, but it appeared to have other plans. It was a nice way to start the trip, though, and my good luck would continue. So that's a great picture of an osprey on the left-hand side there at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Missig. Right. Oh, and then a photo of an American robin on the left and a hairy woodpecker on the right. Alicia S. Nash Preserve by Sean. And as you can see, uh, hairy woodpeckers are distinguished from downies because they have a much more formidable beak. Um, and they also, this would be kind of hard to see, but uh, downies would have some white spots on their, or black spots on their white outer tail feathers, and um, hairies do not have that feature. All right. The sandhill cranes were beginning to get agitated and being very noisy again. I was able to see two pairs and their locations on the other on the other shore across the lake. They would occasionally fly to another area with water behind the lake and fly back again. It wasn't until my second or third visits that I really got to see why people were frequenting this location for the sandhill crane. During these visits, the crane were very prominent and there were pairs flying in and out of the area. I estimated the most I knew of in the area was around 15. So a beautiful picture of Sandal Crane in flight at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Missig. All right, and uh, some more uh, photos of Sandhill Cranes um, flying around at the preserve by Sean. And I really like this one on the left. They're very, you know, synchronized. 
how they're flying. And uh, two more pictures of San Ocarina in flight by Sean Missig. And I, I love the colors in this photo on the left with the, the blue and the, the green here, very vibrant. And then this um, uh, crane right in the middle, very good photo. Well, they're all good photos, but I really like the features in that photo. And a couple more pictures of San Ocarina flying. And this one I thought looked so silly with its legs down. <laughs> it was coming in for a landing, but it just looks a little awkward. Um, very, very funny. All right, the second and third visits also brought trumpeter swans. There was one pair on 411 and a third swan joined on 418. The third swan was not welcomed by the other two and it was left to fend for itself. There were many geese around here as well. They all seemed to be rather aggressive toward one another and were making a lot of noise while putting on quite a show. They were also chasing each other throughout the lake to claim their territory. After the display from the geese had calmed down, I saw something sticking out of the water a little ways out from the dock. At first, I thought it was a branch of some sort that happened to fall in and be floating with the current. When I looked again, it had changed direction, and this time, more of it was sticking out of the water. I decided I needed to get a picture to try and identify what this actually was. Once I was able to put it on a larger screen, it appeared to be a snapping turtle. I was glad that I got the shot, even if it was only the, the snout of this creature. The habitat there is very suitable for snapping turtles, and I'm glad it decided to say hi while it was looking for food. All right, so here are, oh, you know, I forgot to, here, uh, two uh, trumpeter swans at the preserve by Sean Misick. And again, uh, very synchronized in this shot. These birds like to really synchronize with each other. All right, uh, and a couple more pictures of trumpeter swans at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Misick. And a couple more pictures of trumpeter swans at the preserve by Sean. And here are a couple photos of the Canada geese at Lucia S. Nash Preserve. And I like that one on the right. Um, there's a lot of personality in that picture on the right. And then uh, Canada geese on a um, pile of brush there and a snapping turtle on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Sig. All right. While on that dock, I also saw many turkey vultures and great blue herons flying over the area. There was also a pair of pie bill greaves that were fishing for a meal on 411. The walk back to the truck was just as peaceful as the walk out, and not much had changed in the hours I spent on the dock. On 418, I spotted an ultra rare species known as the Owl Rand. While talking with Al, we heard the call of a pine warbler, but it did not want to show itself, and I did not get a shot of it. All of my trips were nothing short of amazing, and I look forward to visiting this location many times in the future. And there's a gorgeous uh, shot of the sun from behind a cloud at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean Missig. All right, so we have an American robin on the left and a red-winged blackbird on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Sean. And species list. So uh, notable species, the osprey, red-breasted nuthatch, golden crown kinglet, yellow-bellied sapsucker, trumpeter swan, pie-bill grebe, Virginia rail, and pine warbler. And a beautiful photo of a blue jay at the preserve by Sean. I know, please excuse me for one moment. All right, I apologize. Moving on. All right, so um, I received a note that Tom, unfortunately, is having a problem with his internet. He usually likes to present his slides, uh, but I will do it for him today. All right, so Tom Fishburn visited the preserve on April 23rd, and this is what he has to say. I visited the Nash Preserve on the morning of Friday, April 23rd, 
One of the first sounds heard were from the Sandhill Cranes, but I only saw them at a distance from the Snow Lake Observation Platform much later. <clears throat> As I started my walk up the Barbara Ellipscomb Trail, I admired the pine trees along the way. I imagined how such an environment looked possible to see one of my nemesis birds, the pine warbler, which I remember seeing only twice before and never well. Then I heard a bird behind me and that sounded like it had, it sounded like it and I reversed my direction to, to check. Here's what I heard. So I will pull up, and I wasn't prepared to do this, so bear with me for a moment. I do wanna pull up on my Audubon app. We can hear the sound of the pine warbler. Now I would just play it, but it doesn't play well over um, uh, over. Um, I would click that link, but that doesn't work well over this system. So let me just bump up my volume on my phone here, and I'll hold it up to my microphone. All right. So that is what um, a pine warbler sounds like and what Tom Fishburn heard that made him turn around and go and seek out that bird. So he says, I checked my app for the song and was convinced. Looking up, I eventually spotted the pine warbler very active at the top of the pines. A little later, I played my app briefly and it responded quickly and came lower. This brightly colored singer would jump from branch to branch between its songs but before long, it flew back up higher. I fired off my camera, hoping to get a few focus images with the pine warbler clear of branches and in an appealing pose. And as you can see those two photos on the right, it looks like he achieved his goal. Very beautiful photos of the pine warbler. Um, and I love them both. The one where it's in, in, in the in front of the pine needles, it almost looks like it's on a throne <laughs> of some kind. Um, yeah, very beautiful pictures of this very pretty bird. All right, further along the trail, I heard wood ducks above me and spotted several in the trees. And again, later walking back after spending time by Snow Lake, I came across a group of about 10 in the marsh by the wetland overlook. April had been amazing for wood ducks as I have seen many in several locations. At Snow Lake, I spent about an hour on the observation deck. I heard the distant Daniel cranes most of that time and saw them pop up a few times, but too quickly. Then when I was considering heading back, I saw two flying around enough to get a distant photo. In the meantime, there were other birds to watch, which I have included in my album. So here are, is the picture of the two Sandhill Crane in flight on the other side of the Snow Lake by Tom Fishburn. And then from here on out, uh, just the pictures he included in his album. So we have on the left a, a rusty blackbird and a red winged blackbird on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom Fishburne. And then the wood ducks. Uh, a male on the left, a female in the center, and then the male on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom. And I'm glad he got these photos because like I said in my my piece, like I did not see I didn't see them very well. Um, I identified them by their sound and and I knew they were above me and that's like where a wood duck would be in the forest. They like to be up high in the trees. So um, I'm glad he got some pictures and they weren't easily startled by him walking through the woods. All right, um, another a couple of photos here of blue winged teal, um, really a close up on the left there and then uh, two in flight on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve. And a pied bill grieve on the left and Great Blue Heron on the right at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom Fishburn. And Pie Blue Grieve is one of my favorite birds. I'm very jealous that he saw that. They're very cute. All right, another um, a couple pictures of Wood Duck here in flight at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom Fishburn. And then Blue Jay on the left and Northern Cardinal on the right. Two very standard birds, but beautiful photos of them at Lucia S. Nash Preserve by Tom Fishburn. And Red Winged Blackbird on the left 
and a black capped chickadee on the right at the preserve. Nice, uh, sharp, clear image of that uh, red winged blackbird and of the chickadee. And it's hard um, for me to get pictures of chickadees. They move around and they're small. Um, and that's a very gorgeous photo of one. All right, and uh, that's it for the presentation. I want to say thank you to Al Ram, Sean Missig, and Tom Fishburn for going out to the location and uh, submitting materials for me to include to show to all of you tonight. And a huge thank you to the Nature Conservancy for the Lucia S. Nash Preserve. I've included the address there. I put that in my GPS. It took me right there. It's not complicated to, to find. Um, when you pull in, it, it is just a, a very narrow drive. Only one car can get through, but they have little pull-off points that if you see a car coming, whoever gets there first needs to pull to the side and you can kind of get around each other. So just uh, be aware of that. Um, but knowing that going in, you should be fine. Uh, please visit the wcautobahn.org website for more virtual field trip opportunities. Um, this month, we are visiting the Oberlin Preserve. Uh, in search of um, the spring warblers and uh, American goldfinch. So hope to see those two um, types of birds there. And then if you are on Instagram, please follow us at WC Audubon and use hashtag WC Audubon when posting your bird photos to be uh, considered to be featured by our organization. And so with that, I am going to open up uh, this meeting to uh, discussion. So if anyone has anything they want to say or share, um, please go ahead and come off mute and let's have a conversation. Oh, Jan says on the chat, your programs are better than anything on TV. Well, thank you so much. That makes me feel so good. And I certainly enjoy doing these programs. And Marie says, thank you for sharing. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, Nancy loves the drop of water on the loon's head. Thank you. I was pretty close to it. It was, um, I, I, I climbed down on, uh, it was like, because I was up on the road, I just I just pulled off to the side and then the, the, um, the, the reservoir was a little further down, so I climbed down onto some rocks. I was almost level with it and it was pretty close and uh, there, there were some um, coops in, in the background, it just kind of was weaving in and out um, with that flock. So I, I got some pretty close shots of it. All right. Um, anything anyone would like to say? Does anyone know, do woodpeckers, are they known for having, like, really flexible necks? So ever since I saw that downy turning its head, like, almost like the other way, and then now this red-bellied woodpecker, are they known specifically for being like super flexible and doing that as compared to other birds? I don't know for sure, but I've definitely seen many woodpecker myself do the same thing. Okay. And I just think, how do they do that without snapping their neck? <laughs> right. I think, I think you'd be surprised that most birds can really twist their heads and necks around oh. quite, a, quite a bit. You okay. think about it. They have to preen, uh, you know, all over their mm -hmm. body, so they've got to get that beak everywhere. So being having a flexible neck, um, they have twice as many vertebrae in their neck than we do. Okay. So again, like a snake, real flexible. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I'll have to watch for that in other birds, and um, maybe it just it stands out because woodpecker tend to stay you know, in the same spot for a minute to really get into their the holes and, and crevices to, to get their food. So I, I, that, I think, that's why. I think you're yeah. right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. I do want to say for the record that uh, these trips and spending all that time on the dock, not only was it amazing, but uh, it inspired me to find a hat so I no longer have issues with sunburn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, welcome to the, the world of a naturalist. <laughs> you're spending a lot yeah. of time outside. You're going to need to invest in hat and um, sunscreen. But um, yeah. coral, reef, coral reef environmental safe sunscreen. Because we, we don't want to put any more harmful chemicals into the environment that we, that we can help. 
I need to get a better hat. That's when I, I realize too much on sunscreen. I need to get a better hat to wear, because especially with Overland Preserve, that I don't know if there's a lot of shade there, but it looks like it's in a lot of field, right? Sean, you've been out there, right? Yes, and it is a lot of uh, open area, even the access path that I've mm -hmm. found most of my wildlife on. Um, you, you get a couple pockets of shade from some taller trees, but for the most part, that is wide open as well. All right. Thank you for the warning. <laughs> and uh, the wetland is a little bit small, and any time that I've been there, it hasn't been overly busy with a lot of wildlife, um, but it is very beautiful back there, and okay. I've seen a million turtles out on oh, all the roads, okay. ranging, from, ranging from tiny little, almost pepperoni size, all the way up to full-grown adults. Okay. So, ni nice to see that back there. Cool. That is great. That's at Oberlin, right, that you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. There's an image I cannot get out of my head, a pepperoni-sized turtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was very, very cute, and yep. uh, I definitely tried to get pictures of it. And I mean, maybe it's a little bit bigger than a, than a pepperoni, but <laughs> well, maybe not. They have to. They have to start out small. You know, they come out of an yep. egg. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other uh, thoughts or comments before we end the call today? All right. Well. Thank you all very much for attending tonight, and um, I hope to see you all at the um, the next call on um, in June. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Michelle, and everyone.